from Flourish DX School, this is the Flourishing at School podcast. With mental health becoming a global priority, we are your partner for creating schools where students, teachers and school leaders feel good and function well, becoming the best versions of themselves and contributing to a flourishing world. Welcome to the Flourishing at School podcast. I'm Tamara Lechner. Each week we bring you the best practitioners, academics, and everything in between in order to inform whole school mental health. I am beyond delighted to have an old friend of mine as a guest today, Justin Robinson. And Justin, we normally start with some type of well-being check-in or activity, and I thought immediately of your brain breaks. And so I wonder if before we even introduce you, You can start us off with some type of state management, brain break, some type of primer to get us really ready for this. Okay. Um, So many to choose from. And uh, generally, (laughs) our our brain breaks tomorrow, and and lovely to be here, generally our brain breaks are energizing. But sometimes, of course, a brain break appropriately can be the opposite and can be calming. And so to some extent, the last thing I need is a bit more energy right now because I'm a little bit toey and nervous, but glad to see you. And so an interesting calming one that um, a fellow teacher gave to me at a conference um, was the idea, and it will be weird and um, it would only take us a few seconds, but it's the idea of sitting still and calmly. And yes, by all means, focusing on your breath. But the, the concept for a young child is for your tongue not to touch any part of your teeth or the roof of your mouth. And so you sit there with your mouth closed and sit simply for you, you, you have to kind of focus so closely on that tongue and it's quite, quite manageable for a period of time. But you know, can you for 30 seconds just focus and for your tongue not to touch anything else in your mouth? And so that's a, a focus a concentrating, a mindful sort of brain break. So maybe the opposite of what you're expecting, but <laughs> no. uh, a little challenge there. It was beautiful. And I like to bookend my day with different types of state management. That was lovely. So the whole time that you were explaining it, I was trying it. And you do see how the wheels are turning and it's either calming you or engaging you. So thank you for that. And now I will introduce you to our audience. So I first heard of Justin when I was doing backwards chain research to find out who were the best of the best in the world of well-being at school. And Justin led the team at Geelong Grammar School, the Institute of Positive Education, where I was fortunate enough to spend time working for and with him. Justin has trained thousands of educators around the world in designing evidence-informed approaches to well-being and he is the former director of the Institute of Positive Education. He is also an honorary fellow at the University of Melbourne and a board member of the International Positive Education Network. So welcome, Justin. Thanks, Tamara. Thank you. And you know, for you to be able to say around the world is probably a little bit uh, of an exaggeration, but also partly um, enabled by, you know, your support and your work. And so I have trained teachers in Canada and in Vancouver Island and in Vancouver and in Toronto and those sorts of things. And I've been very fortunate to get to know your family, Tamara, and to to spend time with you and to feel the energy of considering how best we can support schools and teachers and and students. And that's kind of what where we have our our shared passion. And so thank you for the introduction and you know nice to be here. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to other episodes and uh, enjoy calling Jason and yourself my friends and colleagues uh, sharing our passion for doing similar work. Thank you for that. And I should say to our audience that Jason is not here today because he is immersed in his psych health and safety work and some big announcements we're going to be bringing to everybody in the near future. So he would love to be here and be chatting with you as well, Justin. So Jason and I as you said, our friends, but I would love for you to share with our audience who doesn't know you, who hasn't heard of Justin Robinson in five minutes or less. <laughs> could you tell us about your career to date? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'll have no problem under five, but then at times people have said, I, I, I'm certainly not very good at an elevator pitch. 
Um, it's a long <laughs> elevator ride with me. And um, so I could probably talk about my career in under five minutes, but if you ask me to speak about pos ed or wellbeing education in under five minutes, I'll struggle. Um, so, so interesting, isn't it, to consider you know, which parts do you draw on in emphasising your journey, your career? Um, I think I'd like to start with my mum and dad. Um, so my dad is a very passionate man and a very passionate educator. So he was a career teacher, taught for more than 40 years, uh, and he's still, he's 84 at the moment, Dad, still the chair of the Heathmont History Society, still published another book about local history last year and so on. They're celebrating the 100th year of the Heathmont uh, suburb in Melbourne uh, this year. Dad's a part of and so on. So Dad's passion for teaching, passion for just being actively involved in life, I think, led me to become a, a teacher. Four kids mum and dad had. I was the third. My younger sister, Tamara, was the fourth. And number three and four both went into teaching, but number one and two uh, went into engineering and science. But um, So I think there's a lot of teaching in our family. But then my mum, so I, I kind of think of my dad's passion, and then I think of my mum's compassion. And mum is the most incredibly compassionate, loving uh, mum and human uh, and mum just had her 80th birthday, and that was very special for us. Um, but all of my life, my mum has lived with a mental illness. And so that's where my, you know, a, an underpinning to my passion for well-being comes from my um, exposure and my support and caring of and living with mum. And so mum... Um, lives with obsessive compulsive disorder, um, OCD, and mum has a chronic fear of germs. And so she's a chronic hand washer. And, and mum will wash her hands somewhere around seven or eight hours today. Um, and uh, mum's now wheelchair bound and there's not very much of her. And for any challenge of mum to kind of prepare food or to clean or for her to feel that she's clean enough and so on is very demanding. Um, and, and, and so... Those two things partly wanted me to help mum, partly gave me a passion to teach, uh, grew up in a, a Christian family, was actively involved in our church youth group. And so our church youth group had a, a strong um, a strong foundation in my life and where I met my wife, Jeanette, and it was a really active youth group and you're allowed to be young people kind of on committees and doing things or helping others and having fun uh, connecting together. I used to hang out for Friday nights. Um, and so from there, I then you know, was able to do a Bachelor of Education and was able to uh, start teaching and, and really have only taught at kind of two, maybe three schools. But Trinity Grammar School, an amazing boys' school in Melbourne, um, uh, had 14 years there. That included a one-year teaching exchange over in the UK, and that's where I was introduced to boarding. Uh, and so the boarding kind of concept of a little village school, an amazing village school, Uppingham School in the UK, um, you know, famous traditional uh, UK boarding school. I came back to Trinity and then Jeanette and I set up the boarding house at Trinity Grammar, reintroduced boarding to Trinity. And then the interest of my head at Trinity, Rick Tudor, a real mentor of mine, said to me, he goes, Justin, I think you, it, we, we, I think he said, we love you being here at, at Trinity Grammar, but really you need to go and try to find another school and get involved. And, and we thought about Geelong Grammar School and I was able to become a head of house at Geelong Grammar School. And that just so happened to be kind of a year or so before Geelong Grammar School embarked on positive psychology and positive education and so on. And so it was, you know, February the 12th, which is my birthday, 2006, when Martin Sullivan first came to Geelong Grammar School and just gave a talk in, uh, in the staff room. And it was a Sunday, uh, but because so many live on campus there and there was a hundred people in the room and, uh, and that was a very significant kind of start of that next chapter. You know, when the opportunity to be the head of positive education arose, I kind of had both hands up. I said, I'd love to do that. Uh, and it's not that I didn't love my maths teaching. So I think for me, when people kind of talk about well-being education and is your school a well-being school or an academic school, like, that contrast makes no sense to me because it, it had always been both. And I think it is both to kind of every educator. But you still hear the media kind of talk about, oh, you're a well-being school or you're an academic school. Um, and so I've always been passionate about teaching maths and physical education. I am a co-author of uh, the Cambridge University uh, maths series here in Australia. Uh, so passionately believe I've taught 
yeah, all the subjects through to year 12 and in the IB and the VCE and so on, but also have been passionate about caring for young people. So ahead of year, ahead of boarding, ahead of house and so on. So those sides of things, the, the privilege to connect with a child, a, a, a teenager more for me, not primary school students so much, uh, and their family and to care for them uh, has been very special. And so then the opportunity to uh, be involved actively in positive education, as the term was coined, uh, I was excited by. And so then after five years at Geelong Grammar as a head of house, then I think was four years as the head of positive education and then eight years as the um, the director of the Institute of Positive Education. And, and kind of starting that in 2014 tomorrow for us was... Um, it, as much as it was an opportunity, it felt a responsibility. Um, and that's because, like Geelong Grammar, we all know, is a very fortunate school, very um, fortunate uh, underpinning by the Geelong Grammar School Foundation, which funded and supported the initiative by supportive parents who contributed. Um, and, and so not many schools could afford to have the resources and the energy and the commitment to be able to have this you know, brand new approach to, to well-being in schools underpinned by the staff training um, in, in that field. And, and so when we were showing people uh, around Geelong Grammar and people were curious about what we were doing, they were going, well, how do we do that? And, and there weren't too many answers there. There weren't like, there weren't well-being surveys. There weren't well-being curriculum. There wasn't well-being training. And, and fortunately, and super excitingly, there is now not a plethora of them, but there is a good number of things that provide choice and different entry points and to help schools to have these focuses. So it doesn't mean it's easy. It's still challenging. Um, and so on. So, so therefore, it felt a responsibility for the school to establish an institute. And that was a very rewarding time. You know, the ups and downs, the challenges, the passion of it all, the opportunities for us to kind of support schools, to see different schools, to travel uh, around Australia and around the world. So I must be somewhere close to my five minutes. Uh, and oh then my the goodness, you are so much longer, but it's awesome. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> and then the last thing was that, the, you know, uh, January the 1st, 2022, we established our own little wellbeing company uh, called the Wellbeing Distillery committed to distilling the science and practice of well-being to make it as easy as possible for schools predominantly. That's our lane. That's where David and Amy and myself, the three of us at the Wellbeing Distillery, we're all teachers by heart and through by career. And so our lane is how can we help make this work easier for the well-being teachers, for the well-being principals and school leaders, for the students, for the parents. Um, what can we do to, to contribute to this idea of, you know, Seligman's, you know, you know uh, inspiring kind of calling of could 51% of the world be flourishing by 2051 or something. So, you know, we hope that we can be a little part of contributing to the well-being of humanity. Well, thank you for sharing that. It is inspiring to watch how you followed your heart and your curiosity mm. and just conquered the next problem, the next, the next. And I loved how you said an opportunity and a responsibility. And mm. a lot of the story that you shared had the two sides of it that we're, we're looking for wellness, but it might have come out of a place of lack of wellness. So we've yes. got the the darkness and the light on on yes. both sides of all of all of this curiosity that you have followed. Yes. Yeah. What I wonder if you could tell our audience a bit about, because I don't even know very much about this, and I'd love to hear you explain mm. your framework that you're using, which I know connects yes. back to Martin's and Perma and all yeah. of the research and the evidence and, and frameworks. But I would love to hear what you've landed on and, and why mm. it works for you. Yeah, thank you. Dara. Where to start and how to <laughs> so I think the starting point, I would say, is that it's not that one model is right and one model is wrong and so on. That That's not what it's about. What it's about is we need a way to try to define and describe well-being. And everyone does. And that's kind of weird in a way because everyone knows what well-being is. But also it's misunderstood. Um, and so what are the elements of well-being? And many of the listeners tomorrow would be familiar with uh, Marty Seligman describing it like the weather. 
And for me, that's still, particularly when talking to students or parents, the, the clearest metaphor that says, well, you know, the weather you can't actually measure, there is no such thing as weather. We, we've made up that term to describe real elements, and those real elements are temperature and their wind pressure and their atmospheric pressure and their humidity and their rainfall and so on, and there's about half a dozen of them. And collectively we put them together and we can measure each of those individually and then we call that weather. But you can't give weather a score out of 10. Weather can't be seven, weather can't be three. You know, you were saying before we started that it's been pretty chilly over on Vancouver Island for a while um, and so on. But, but that doesn't mean that the weather was a particular number. And so in the same way, well-being is a made-up term. And it can represent real things that we can measure, not as easily as you can measure temperature or atmospheric pressure or something, but you can measure the quality of your relationships. You can measure how engaged you feel in life. You can measure the sense of meaning and purpose that you feel in life, of course, subjectively. And you could maybe invite others to contribute as well and trying to get some kind of 360 sort of view and so on. So, so well-being is a multifaceted construct. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And then the kind of question goes, well, what are the, what are, what are the facets? Um, and, and to some extent, as we've supported quite a number of schools over the years, uh, help create their model, their framework. Well, this just allows you to have a language. And so I don't particularly mind if resilience is in there or isn't in there. Or if mindfulness, you know, which isn't in Geelong Grammar School's model for positive education, and in hindsight, I think we should have put it there. You know, it was underpinned by character strengths, and it was Craig Hassett who said it really maybe it should be overarching the, the skill of mindfulness. And so, you know, so, so there's all, so we don't believe um, right or wrong. But believe it is helpful to have a language, and particularly if it's got some um, co-creation of your community that can own it rather than it kind of just be placed in there. So um, we've spent you know, a good six months trying to think, well, where do we feel it is now? You know, and, and, and to be helpful, we've always, maybe me particularly, I've got a danger of being overwhelming, of being too comprehensive. And sometimes you know, I completely get that the answer is, well, keep it simple. You know, you know, I get well-being and well-being says PERMA and PERMA is pretty clean and so on. But, you know, um, so where we kind of the thinking came to, we completely, you know, who, who are we, not researchers, not psychologists, to say that PERMA is missing an element or we should add on PERMA plus or PERMA H and Vs and all these sorts of things and so on. Where that got to um, was this idea that there's character strengths and there's these six domains and so over the years of us working with schools, people talk about, of course, the importance of sleep and nutrition and exercise. Now, Marty doesn't say that they're not important. They didn't fit in PERMA. He kind of views them as foundational to well-being, like you need those as a foundation. And of course, the very first initial training we did with Martin Seligman and his team was a nine-day resilience course. And so we kind of popped resilience under health. So how does that fit? At the time? So where we got to was, well, really the reason we're doing all this work, and it felt so pertinent during the pandemic and so on, is for our communities to be resilient, for our individuals, for the families, for the teachers, for the school community to be resilient. That's the, that's the purpose. So you can embrace change. You can adapt to change. You can feel confident and make the most of future kind of change. So who wouldn't want their child and then themselves to be a resilient person? Because we know we're in uncertain times and that looks to be more and more the case in the future. So resilience became this number one asset why we do this work. Let's not lead with kind of positive emotions or something which can confuse people to think it's all about happiness. Let's lead with this huge important skill, the asset of resilience. So strongly believe in character strengths and mindfulness. And so they go, oh, there's two things. And these we viewed as lenses. So we had the A for the asset. And the lens is kind of like when I did the work with Ryan Nemick from the VIA Institute, his mindfulness-based strengths practice course, which is very powerful for me. And he viewed them kind of like you put on your glasses. And this is your mindfulness glasses, which makes you very present. And these are your character strength glasses, which help you to notice and use your own strengths and notice the strengths in others. So suddenly we had two lenses. 
And then quite easily, as many people have, have got the sleep, nutrition and exercise. So that was a three. So I go, oh, we've got a one asset. We've got two lenses. We've got three. Now, what do you call those? What are sleep, nutrition and, and exercise? Are they kind of foundations? Are they you know, pillars? What were we going to call them? And then, of course, we wanted to honor PERMA because we believe so strongly in the five elements of well-being that Martin Seligman describes. And then we're also missing a four. So I thought, well, we would need to. And there are other things that we thought were important. And the four we got to was things that give you direction in your life, that guide your life. And so for us, these were your values. And we've done a lot of work on the importance of understanding your values with our students and with us. So there's your values. Once you've got your values, then you can get your goals. Once you've got some goals, some of those might become your habits. Once you've got your habits, then also one of the key things, particularly during the pandemic, and it feels like well-being at the moment and particularly important for teachers, is don't forget your boundaries. And you may need to establish healthy boundaries is maybe one of the key elements for someone's well-being. So suddenly we had these four elements, um, uh, the four elements of your values, your goals, your habits and your boundaries. And we called them they will give you direction if we can align these together. So what gives you direction? The maths teacher came out, Dave was chatting about, we came up with vectors because a vector gives you, has an arrow on one end and kind of gives you direction and alignment. So then we go, well, we've got an asset, we've got some lenses, we've got these vectors, we've got these elements that Seligman has given us, and in the middle were these three. And so we came up with the term after much deliberation of that's your infrastructure. That's your, that was our way of saying foundation. Your infrastructure, if you've got your infrastructure right in, in a community, that might be that you've got your roads right and you've got your, you know, all the, the network of support and safety if you've infrastructures right. So therefore that became alive. And that word alive was a very powerful term for us. It implies for us to be energized, to be vital and alive through your well-being with the asset of resilience, the lenses of character strengths and mindfulness, the infrastructure of sleep, nutrition and exercise, the vectors of our values, goals, uh, habits and boundaries, and then the elements of PERMA positive emotions, engagement, relationship, meaning and accomplishment. So, But now the danger is these 15 elements maybe feel overwhelming. We hope they don't. Um, and it, it's, it's because we believe there are skills and tactics in each of those elements that are critical. Now, some person, when they do our course, may go, I don't need too much of the exercise one. I feel uh, I'm quite knowledgeable about exercise, the benefits of it. I have my own habits and routines. I might even skip that little part of the, that module. And so, or they might go, I'm passionate about exercise. I'm going to go there first to hear the latest about what some of the wellbeing science is saying about the importance of exercise. So that's alive. We don't, we endeavor not to call it tomorrow a model or a framework. It's an approach to wellbeing. And here's an approach that has 15 elements under the five letters of the alive. And any school can engage with those elements and then they could build their own model or they could already have an existing wellbeing model, all that sort of thing. Very welcome and encouraged. But we hope these our goal was that the 15 elements gave a comprehensive coverage of the science of wellbeing. Wow. So our audience is going to need a cheat sheet for this. I love it. It had so much in it. And I know we can find lots of details on your website, The Wellbeing yeah. Distillery. What I'm curious about, because one of the things you talked about was boundaries. Mm. So, so what didn't make it in? Because you talked about a lot of things yeah. that you've included that are all important. And I know we, we always, when we talk about this work, we're like, okay, where does self-esteem fit? And where does mm. flexibility, there, there's so many mm. things. And depending on the lens you're wearing, mm. they have different priorities. Yes. Can you think of something that didn't make it in that, that you put a boundary <laughs> on and said, this, this, this isn't our lane? So I think my first answer to that is, I hope not. If the second answer is, of course, there's another hundred things that have missed out. Um, but I think you can fit them into some sub subheadings or subsets. Uh, and I think even in some ways, Marty Seligman would say, well, PERMA will cover it all. Um, and I can tell you that you know, character strengths is all about engagement. So I'll just pop strengths under engagement. So, so I think, um, but it felt that list and that set of modules was powerful. Psychological safety is a is not there as a, a specific heading. 
a specific module, we cover it in relationships. And that's a key element of psychological safety and, and security and the circle of security and so on. So there's that element. Uh, we were keen, I was very keen to do something on time the importance of time that we can't actually make any more of it you know it, it but it feel felt like over the years of supporting people with well-being that predominantly the answer came down to a lack of time so yeah that'd be great to keep a gratitude journal but when i'm going to find time to do that yeah that'd be lovely to do active constructive responding with my students but when i'm going to find our time to do that and so 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 uh now we do touch on time partly in our goals and partly in our habits module um so so i think yes there are another hundred things and i'm sure some of the listeners will go but what about this and i'm passionate about and so on uh and great and, and bring it on um but <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's a bit of my answer to that. So thanks. Thank you. And I, I, I'm poking the bear because I know that you've really put a ton of thought into this. And I like hearing your process. I, I asked you because I like to hear how, how you sort it. And we've seen these things as you were talking about with time. I do some work with Stephen Kotler's group and they talk a lot about time and their work is all through the lens of flow and peak performance. But it's everything that you just talked about. It, it's yes. all of those same skills. And so I think you and I can agree that out there, there are many ways to lead the horse to the water and then we got to hope they drink. And yes. they have to have the autonomy to yes. connect it to what they're already doing and make it fit within the time they have. So you I have such a... Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, choice and voice as you know, as yes. a lovely little three word, little kind of acronym or a little kind of distilled message of the importance of choice and voice. And hopefully anybody's uh, robust um, well-being approach or model can allow then choice and voice. And as you say, we must invite people to us. We, we realize without a doubt we can't force ourselves on anybody and not that we want to, but we kind of want to because we want good things for them and we want to help. But we must not do that. We must ensure that we're inviting people to this space, to this well-being table. Yeah, that's that's an interesting thought, and it connects with something I'm going to share about another group that I work with called Empathable, um, and they've really created this how to how to make radical change without changing the radicals. And and Micah was on one of our recent episodes, and I really learned a lot from the way he's doing diversity, equity, inclusion training by not thinking about having to change the person who wants no part of this, who is the most oppositional and defiant, but actually working with the people who are on the edge, who are curious, but maybe not jumping in. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that type of change, uh, again, uh, as you said, choice and voice um, makes such a difference. So you've had such experience with your own school teachers and students, and also helping others around the world. I wonder if you can share with our audience Something that you've tried or seen tried in a mm. school setting that worked really, really well. Mm. Um, if I just tomorrow, just go back a, a, from what you were saying, which I was uh, really in, enjoying. Um, it reminded me of Stephen Meek was the, the principal at Geelong Grammar School that um, when I was actively there and um, he called me in one day and I, I was talking to him. I said, like, not all the students are enjoying, you know, the pos ed lessons. Uh, and, and that's your kind of, you know, and I could get, expand, say, like, not all the teachers are enjoying the wellbeing training or not all the parents are coming to the wellbeing courses or something. And, and so that idea of the radicals or the ones who aren't, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, they're yet and, and curious and so on. And, and he said to me, he goes, now, Justin, you know, did everyone enjoy your math class? And I said, yes. <laughs> and then I, said, well, I said, well, I suppose if I'm being honest, no, probably not. No, there were some students who didn't love my maths classes and there were some parents who didn't love maths as a subject. And so, yeah, so, so it was weird that I had, and I think, you know, so many people had kind of thought that you had to have everyone, you know, and you never had it with any other academic subject you never had it with even any other topic or any other charity or any other anything so so why and i get why because well well being's everyone's birthright 
mobbing. Everyone's, you know, it, it's right and fair and with the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, that of course we want well-being for any minority group and we want to. So, so I get why we want it to be everyone, but it's unrealistic to think. Uh, and, and that genuinely helped me. Um, now, I, I think you, you, you don't want to be helped because you want to keep striving for. Well, why is that student disengaged? Or why is that parent not finding? Or is there a way that I can express my language in a different way that's more um, invitational or more curious and those sorts of things? So, so I think, but not to beat yourself up about it because that's not helping anyone. You know, to to look for and recognise. And I love, and I'll come back to your question about what's something that's worked. And it's so important to have a couple of things that worked and to remember those because there'll be some things that don't work. Uh, and, and again. If you're creating and designing and trying, then, of course, there'll be things that don't work. And we know that for our students. We tell them, you know, give it a go and it doesn't matter and embrace failure. But then suddenly we're trying to run something. You're like, no, I don't want to embrace failure. <laughs> so <laughs> so, so uh, just a comment if you wanted to tomorrow, then I'll come back and answer your question. Yeah, no, I I couldn't agree more. And and around the failure, I always say, if, if you haven't failed, if you haven't tried something that didn't work, you're not trying hard enough because mm. you're, you're playing too safe and, and mm. no big change ever happens through safety. Mm. Mm. But it's not that fun trying something as a teacher and setting up this great day or this great lesson or this evening for parents and people walk out and go, that was a bit of a waste of time. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, it's so much easier as a teacher to say to the students, you know, oh, you embrace failure and it doesn't matter and all those sorts of things. So, so uh, back to your question, Tamara. Um, I, I think, uh, I, no, I was going to say maybe it's controversial, but I don't think it is. But I, I think for me, still some of the most powerful, powerful things that I've done uh, at Geelong Grammar School and, in, and with some others is the training of staff. When you get that piece right, and I remember tomorrow you doing the Discovering POSED course, or maybe it was the Discovering More POSED course, or something, but, you know, the – and – Gosh, it feels good to be able to be a part of that team delivering that and be a part of that team creating the safe space, the vulnerable space for people to be curious about their well-being, to remember some things they've forgotten, to talk to another colleague and be interested about and to, to know them. You know, deep down we yearn to be connected. We yearn to care for other people and those sorts of things inside. And we're in a very busy world and society that's not generally helping our well-being naturally. Um, and so the staff training, whilst, of course, not every staff member has ever always enjoyed it and those sorts of things. Um, and sometimes when I look at the feedback, I look there nervously, hoping to get a few sevens or something like that. But, uh, but the idea of, uh, in the times when uh, an email or someone popped into my office and said, you know, can I just let you know you've made a difference in my life or can I let you know you've made a difference in my marriage or that I feel that I'm more engaged in my teaching? Or so. so they're pretty powerful. So helping adults. Uh, who have lived a life, who have gone through ups and downs, who have got wisdom from their lived life to go, ah, oh, let's take this time, these, this day or these days or these hours to think, to pause, to connect, to be and think about, is this the life I'm wanting to live? How can I do it in some other way? What's another thing that I can do that help care for myself or help to my relationship with my partner or my children or my students and so on? So, so I think the staff training has something that I, I think, and, and at Geelong Grammar for, you know, um, for now more than a decade, uh, well more than a decade maybe, you know, that's the way staff started at Geelong Grammar School. And so whether you were the cleaner, whether you were the new principal, whether you were a new teacher, whether you were involved in some way in the operational staff, you started with a three-day course uh, mm -hmm. where you connected with people. And what that message said to these new staff members is we're a community here and we've got a language about well-being and our, your well-being is important. And, of course, you know, the well-being of our students is critical, but we're going to do that by supporting your well-being so you can be the best you can be in your roles, the important roles you have across the school. So whilst many schools are unable to, you know, create a three-day course or to have something quite as long or something as sustainable and all those sorts of things, uh, I believe that every school has the capacity to train their staff, you know. Now, not the capacity tomorrow, but if a principal said to a passionate well-being educator, you know, uh, in six months' time, could you give us a presentation on gratitude? 
Um, you know, that person might be energised. They can do the research that you and I have done, Tamara. They can look up. They can think of activity. They know the staff members' names. They can design a really beautiful half hour or one hour session on gratitude. Um, you know, and so on. So, so the the power of establishing and inviting and informing and energising staff through staff training, I think, would be one thing. That's. I will double click on that one. Because so many schools come to us at Flourish DX and say, oh, we just want to measure the students. And yeah. my heart just sinks because what message does that give to the staff yeah. that, yeah, you're busy, yeah, you're tired, but we're, we're going to fix the students. And, and yes. so I'm always really buoyed up by anyone who already comes and shows up with, we, we want to show the staff that they belong, that they matter, that their well-being, that their psychological health yes. and safety yes. is of value. Yes. And, and, so and in their hands. And in their hands. That, yeah. I, love, I love the saying, you know, your future is in capable hands. Yours. Mm. Uh, you know, that yeah. idea that, that you can, you know, the fact that you know, when you learn in a course that you can initiate positive emotions, they don't just happen to you. You can kind of generate gratitude. You can generate contentment. You can drive home and try to enter your house in an emotional state to help that ripple. You know, wow, I, I feel empowered. That's the hope that you feel empowered by this, you know, you know flourishing field of well-being science. Yeah, I love that. Um, normally, we ask next, tell me something that went wrong. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I have so many other things that I want to okay. ask you. But do you have just a short sound bite or we learned this lesson, we're sharing it with you so you don't make the same mistake as us. <laughs> yes. What would your what went wrong be? Uh, as you know, we've done the 10 lessons that we got wrong uh, and maybe other listeners have heard those. Uh, and so there's, it's a long list. Um, if I go, maybe if I go with some three letter ones, uh, some three word ones of with not to uh, or uh, describe, not prescribe. Maybe they're the two. So try to do well-being with the students. So that means you must not just kind of ask them occasionally. You must constantly involve them. You know, get the students to read the well-being survey results from Flourish DX. You know, don't get the staff to spend time over it. Just get some students over lunchtime to sit there and say, give us your five key findings from that well-being data. That's doing it with them. Ask them. So do well-being with your community, not to them. And your goal is to simply describe well-being, not to prescribe it. You go to the doctor to get prescribed medication if you've got a, a physical illness, uh, but for the mental health and well-being, you can't get that prescribed. You need someone to describe it, to invite you into it. You need to explore. You, you are a unique person with a unique culture and background and history and hopes and dreams and so on. So two quick ones. Those are great quick ones. I'm going to grab onto those for sure. <laughs> I could absolutely talk to you for hours and hours and days and days, but I, I know our audience can't listen for that long. And one of the things that we promise them is, is a distilled message, a short message. But what I do want to ask you, we're a podcast and both Jason and I are curious humans who are constantly listening and, and finding new resources. Uh, and so I wonder if you might share with our audience where you go to learn. What are your podcasts, your books? Who are your influences? Oh, again, huge long list. Um, but, uh, I still can't go past TED Talks. I, I still regularly listen to a TED Talk. There's always too many that I want to listen to and I'm curious about. So, you know, of course, that's no news to anybody. Uh, I'm a Tim Ferriss fan. Uh, I got through that through David was the one who kind of put me on to him. And you've kind of popped your Andrew Huberman with them or something, and but they're long. And so whilst I like them, they're quite long, but they've got some absolute gold in them on a long car drive or something. Um the one that I'd love to maybe make a shout out, a, a local one, uh, and this is called Psych Spiels and Silver mm. Linings by Chris Mackey and Rowan Mackey, his son, uh, friends, and uh, Chris is a renowned child psychologist or psychologist um, uh, in Geelong uh, with a very large, successful practice. And um, so I like the banter between the son and the dad and the way that they cover interesting and rich topics. So that's uh, maybe a helpful new one for. Yeah, I, I love that one. And nobody has has recommended it yet. I especially loved their episode on synchronicity. Yes, because I think often that's something that people don't yes. think of as a science. Yes. They believe that 
these things just happen and it's a coincidence. And actually the science behind having the ability to see it when it's there is something that we can initiate and prolong rather than just waiting for it to happen. So that that is a fabulous fabulous one yeah being on the lookout for as i think of the way chris mackie says like a free kick from the universe yeah i love that a free kick from the universe that that's a brilliant just had their hundredth episode so they've just had their hundredth episode excellent i'm gonna have to uh definitely give that a shout out in our show notes because i enjoy listening to their dynamic as well and that banter well i wish i could talk to you forever but before (laughs) we wind up is there anything that i didn't ask you that you really would love to share with our audience uh, no, it, enjoyable chatting. And, and um, it, some people say it's ironic that you know, we've established a business called the Wellbeing Distillery because I'm not very good at distilling. We teach what we need. Some people have said, ah, you, you got me on the Wellbeing Distillery. Any sentence that's got Wellbeing and Distillery in the one sentence count me in. And other people have said, if there's no gin or there's no alcohol here, then you've disappointed me. You've got this distillery and then you just let me down. Um, and, uh, of course, there is no alcohol. <laughs> of course, we're distilling the science and practice of well-being. But the well-being distillery, we hope, can be helpful to um, the community, uh, particularly the, the broader school community and educators. Um, it, it's been a bit over 12 months now, and we've just mainly been busy writing and recording and developing helpful resources. And we're very close in the next couple of weeks, we'll release the Wellbeing Educator, this course with 15 modules. Um, uh, each module has about a 40 minute uh, video. Uh, each module's got three practical tactics for the classroom teacher. So the whole course has 45 tactics in it. It's got a quite a large you know, playbook that goes along with it and so on. Um, but then our consulting, our partnerships, our, our presentations and our resources that we're, we'll be developing over the years, we're, we're committed to playing a long game and to be of service to people and to keep learning and listening. Um, love to have any conversation with any people. Please get in touch with us and um, thank you for the opportunity, Tamara. Oh, I'm, I'm so pleased that we could talk. Yeah. And one of the things that I usually share when I'm wrapping up at the end is that Flourish DX has a YouTube channel. So if you're listening to us as an audio podcast, you can also see us online. Uh, and Jason and I are active on LinkedIn. But where do we find you and David and Amy if we're looking to learn more from you out there on the social media world? You'd think I'd know all about that, but you're, you're, I'm not in my strength here tomorrow. But we are on Instagram. We're slowly getting there on LinkedIn uh, and our website at thewellbeingdistillery.com. And email is just justin at thewellbeingdistillery.com. And I think our Instagram handle, obviously, is the Wellbeing Distillery. I think. Uh, it is. I, fi- <laughs> I found you. And it looks beautiful. Everybody check out their Instagram. So thank right. Amy and David for that work. So that's, yes, no, nice one. Well, I want to close just by saying you made a difference in my life. And I really, really appreciate that. You have these inflection points where because you met a human, everything changes and you're one of those for me. So thank you <laughs> very for that. Kind, lovely. <laughs> thank you, Tamara. Thank you. You're and welcome. all the very best for the work you and Jason are doing and anything I can do to support. And um, I'm a big fan of Flourish DX. And as Jason knows, we supported 22 Victorian schools with the Flourish DX platform over the last three years. And so had a collaboration with the Institute of POSED and so on. So um, yes, let's and I'm a big fan of sharing out that research with anyone. So yes. if anyone is listening and they want to learn more about that, just find me on LinkedIn and I'll share the resources because we don't like reinventing wheels. Yeah. Nice one. All right. Well, that's it for today. We will catch you on the next episode. And until then, keep flourishing at school and in life. You've been listening to the Flourishing at School podcast. To stay up to date with the latest on whole school mental health, follow Flourish DX School on LinkedIn and subscribe to the Flourishing at School podcast at www.flourishingatschool.com. 